Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Very cool. Let's drop this. What, uh, I used to have a 10 or something. All right. All right. <clears throat> Let's double check, make sure everything, the scenario is fine. Chinese one first. You see is moist, mild breeze, northwest. River is deep with moderate current south. Each multi hex building is a two story house, so you can ignore this. And each location has an inherent uh, stairwell. Mongolians have an ELR 3, which I should have marked, which I don't think this shows up, so it doesn't matter. ELR of 3. Uh, allies, aka the Chinese, have an ELR of 2. I have a SAN of 3, they have a SAN of 2. Um, I can hit one guy, which is hit the map. Elite multi man counters for the Chinese. He's got one guy off, which I need to tell him about. So only the elite Chinese squads can use the LMG without captured weapon penalties, and they're the only ones who can attempt to repair them. Uh, only the elite squads can be marked as dare death. My conscripts, or sorry, the Chinese conscripts can't form multi-location fire groups. And I have to be careful of LVP because if he gets was three plus 15 CVP by turn 5 I lose otherwise he has, to, he has to earn 7 LVP at game end um, LVP is earned by controlling this hex this hex and any hexes with uh, any of the buildings so it has to be uh, multi hex buildings I believe Control of a building east of river. So any building, but um, has to be the entire thing. So if he only controls H2, or I control H3, it does not count for control of building. Uh, labels. Always figured labels automatically should be determined if that's yeah, the case. Oh shit, I need to find. I forgot to, to look up uh, Mongolian names so I can name my leaders. I'll have to do that. Um, yeah, it's seven turns. Seven turns, Chinese start first. I get some reinforcements on turn four. And that's about it, really. SSRs are written here in bullet point just to make it a little bit easier. And as pointed out by my opponent, that doesn't show up, right? Okay. I wonder what, what is the first thing that's going to show up. Uh, sniper will be... Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, that goes perfect. Cool. Uh, 
Ah, okay, so it's size that actually does that. That's cool. All right, so that's my sniper. J4. Cool. Oh, you know what? I should do uh, able able R3. That way I have a more visual reminder on my map. And like that's a thing I think that always screws me up. Because I always forget about <clears throat> always forget about that sort of thing. I still think it's so weird that my cavalry gets the oh, my cavalry on turn four gets to come in on any of these hexes, or any of these hexes, which I think is weird. Like, this is kind of dumb because you have to run the entire railroad, which I guess is fine, if only because if you're if you're losing the front half and this becomes too risky, then you can, you know. You can quote unquote circumvent it by coming down here and then just occupying a bunch of buildings. But it just seems so weird to just be like, oh yeah, I can come in off this road and immediately surround this guy. So the other side he can realistically push on is this side. Because if he doesn't push on this on the right side, then or the northern side, I guess we'll call it, then like yeah. That is uh, problematic. In my opinion, that is problematic. <clears throat> In a way, too, uh, just for the viewers, um, I kind of want a strong formation on the south side. Um, having him on the south side means I have, to, like, he essentially must be pushed north. Um, there's more building hexes, so if I can as long as there's no like major critical problem which there shouldn't be everybody's got low range and he's only got uh, a few i'm gonna pull this up on my other screen so i don't keep looking at it um i know he's got some support weapons i don't know how many elite squads or first line squads or conscripts he has and i know he has leaders but i don't know how many either so and i kind of want to keep it that way so i don't know So it's the map. Cool. Uh, increase to two. And ELR. What was it? Two? Um, God, let's. I'm gonna pull up the advanced sequence of play because I like never use it. Where's my ASOP? I put it. I don't want it on the divider. God damn it! Basic, basic sequence of play. Uh, where's my cool? No house rules. We've already determined. Mac boards and so on. Weather's already there. Streams already there. So same thing with current and blah blah blah. Um, there's no jungle. There's no rice paddies. No reef. No beach slopes. No beach widths. Uh, restrictions on purchases are not available. Battlefield integrity. I, I'm not doing, but I feel like I should. Is there actually battlefield integrity in this? No. Whatever. Um, not important. No overlays or special capabilities that haven't been spoken of. Terrain changement changes, yeah. Uh, OBA draw piles, don't have them. Don't have any of that. No paratroopers. Setup limitations are in place. Did all that. 
I can't Boresight because I don't have any weapons to Boresight with. I don't have vehicles or anything to do hull down, and there's no walls to claim advantage. Uh, I don't have no moves, there's no cloaking. He, opponent has presumably recorded his dare death. I've completed my setup. Put my sniper, the attacker. Oh, yeah, there's no recon. He's done his setup. No Nova. No other crazy weather shit. No field stuff. Oh, he should have put... Uh... Dub, you don't start the seals with anyone outside of concealment tray. Not sure if it affects anyone, but something to keep in mind. Oh, um, what else? What else? What else? Set up sniper counters, which we just did. No bombardments, no creeping barrage. Green rally face, cool. Green chart. Just check to see if anyone is not in a red colored hex. Red color on the chart. Uh, if there is nothing to change, we can start. Brush, yeah, so concealment terrain for anybody watching. Brush, uh, wine yard, woods, orchard, cactus patch, olive grove, grain, marsh, uh, wooden building, stone building, rubble, and certain streams, uh, stream hexes, but only if they include woods, brush, or orchard. Anything else is verboten. Uh, no, I think he's actually fine. Woods, building, orchard. Oh, this guy is in LOS. Uh oh, yeah, this guy might be in LOS. I'm gonna as again get some anybody else no cool let's uh, can I reverse that cool cool the guy it affects is the open crown in uh, two. else is in they're not are these all of crows uh did i miss something and these are all crows all archers oh Concealment terrain. You're good on everyone else.
Yeah, so I forgot that. So, uh, before that fucks me up. Never had a seat. All right. So, uh, let's. That. We'll bring that down here. And use will change all portraits under all of the roofs. Cool. Uh, orchard axes are olive groves. All orchard rules apply. That actually. Eh. Yeah, actually, this makes it even better for me. Okay, so getting back to strategy. And hopefully that gets picked up. Sick, the rule the rules get picked up. Cool. That's the only thing I cared about. Alright, so um speaking to my defense and how I want to set up. So I have a strong setup on the left, and the reason for that is because the right side i'm fine with giving up some territory main things to keep in mind are that a lot more open ground that's like hard to do anything with like if if i have anybody in f1 i can cover this area pretty f like pretty okay ish um the other caveat is um the other caveat is that having a guy in C1, same thing with B1, these two locations can also lock down a good proportion of this area. So I don't really have to worry too much about it. Um, I also can't fire group, so essentially it's just going to be like single guys taking pop shots all the time. Um, and that's why like something like this is kind of more to confuse, like these stacks, they're more or less to confuse to say, okay, well, you don't know where my leader is. Well, technically I have like two leaders. Yeah, I've got two leaders now and I'll get two more later. But this way, my opponent doesn't really know where my leader might be, so, um, or leaders. So if he thinks that I've got a leader back there, that's perfect because that's the sort of thing I want him to believe in. To think that there's, you know, um, less imposing stuff at the front whereas like this 8 1 this 8 neg 1 having that basically watching this hex is powerful stuff um unless i screwed this up and actually uh because of the because of, like the crest line is formed and this hex or whatever i can't actually see down there that would suck but um Yeah, my, I don't know how often my opponents actually played. Um, you don't have to put wall advantage counters because presumably you're going to leave. The only time wall advantage comes into place is if um, if something happens and like, let's say this guy in L7 um, uh, wouldn't matter. Anyways, unless I moved <clears throat> to the adjacent hexes. So the thing is, with wall advantage, there's no reason you... Claiming wall advantage doesn't make sense. Um, actually, this is also a detriment for this one unit. Um, <clears throat> so claiming wall advantage here, whatever, it's not It's not like the... It's not a big thing. It's not re even really a, a, anything to worry about. If you're playing... Um, the way I, I understand it is that you don't really claim a wall advantage unless there's like a chance of me going there. Um, the reason you have claiming like wall claims is because if if I ever move into an adjacent hex like into L3, then you have that wall. Like I would not be able to get the plus two TM from the wall. Um, so there's no point claiming it because we're not at that point yet. Um, you also kind of inherently get wall advantage if you're in that hex. So the only time wall advantage really should come into play is uh, when you have units that start becoming adjacent to each other but not going into melee and, and stuff like that. So in this instance, it just kind of, it's, I don't want to say useless, but basically, like it's, 
don't really need to. Um, the other thing too, and why this is a bad idea to declare it as wall advantage, um, is that technically you're not in the building, you'd be in open ground, but with the wall advantage. And because you're in open ground, this guy would actually lose concealment uh, from how I understand the rules. Because he's not in concealment terrain, he's in he's in open ground considered. Um, and maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, I can always, if anybody has a firmer grasp on the rules, let me know. But as far as I understand it, that's how it would work. Um, and like I said earlier, he's on the attack, so he should be pressuring me, which means he's going to move. And because there's no walls other than up here, it doesn't really matter who's claiming anything. Um, so yeah, that's maybe he might be doing uh, point by point in a in a chart just to see like okay, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? And that's not a bad way to play, because especially if you're new, because uh, you get to learn basically as you go how all the processes work. The only thing that sucks is that if you're not declaring that to your opponent, um, well at least in my case. Because he's not declaring it, I don't know what specifically we're waiting for. So I'm kind of just like twiddling my thumbs and, and wondering what applies and, and what we can go through. Um, does he have... Oh, so he's at the end. So anyways, we're still in the rally phase. It's still turn one. Um, but uh, so getting back to strategy, the entire reason for this, um, at least in my mind, it's, it's aided by the fact that uh, these... Uh, orchards are actually uh, olive grows so um, again having it be a little weaker on the right side means that it's more enticing for him to go there rather than um, bunch up on the left side entirely if i was playing chinese i'd probably max on the left side because uh, as the chinese you have a massive firepower um, advantage and if you can utilize that to get a lot of points really, really quickly, then you can leverage. Uh, it, it feels to me like you leverage a fast win. Um, again, I don't know how many he has of each unit. I can scan this and see that he's got two first lines at least. Um, and again, I know he has got support weapons somewhere. I know he's got. I know he. I know he has some better squads and a lot worse squads than these. But I don't know where specifically and. Um, knowing that he has two first lines here is good because that's two um, of the better units that he has that are essentially at the rear of any combat. Um, if this was me, I'd have I'd probably have everybody set up in uh, the number four hexes because that's just like perfect. Um, I don't know why he's drawing a range at the moment. Um, but basically this is perfect for him because he's, he would immediately get into, um, I don't know why he's checking range. If he's shooting, you can't check range first, uh, unless he's deciding what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. Anyways, um, so, uh, range strangeness aside, so, um, if he goes up the right side, which I'm hoping he does, like in in vigor, um, by going on the right side, he's effectively locking himself into a lot of open ground. Now, this isn't to say that there's you know there's no open ground here. Obviously, there's a bunch of it, but the difference, in my opinion, is that the approach is is has more um, cover that you can use to be protected from the buildings. Because if I retreat into the buildings as the Mongolians, I can then use the protective benefits of the buildings just to get more use out of them. Like in this woods, like I can I can shoot down a lane here to these woods at uh, 08. I can I can shoot down to say this area from this hex, but I can't target anything here. And the same sort of applies from every other building hacks so if you approach this area in on mass then you can you can leverage that sort of um lack of uh firepower that the mongolians would have to do much 
just put the legs. Alright, um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a little bit of funkiness when you're doing range checks. So first, if you're trying to draw uh, LOS, if you click one hex and then drag, it'll check, obviously, the ranges. It doesn't work well with overlays because um, the, the way that the program calculates, it can, it can check for if there's TEM, hindrance, that sort of thing. But if you put an overlay, it doesn't recognize an overlay on a map. It only recognizes the map itself. So when you draw an, L an LOS check, um, if it goes over uh, an overlay, it automatically declares it as not being uh, viewable, like it, it blocks LOS. And um, you should be aware of that if you're playing this game, because uh, if you're playing on Vassal anyways, because you, you want to have some knowledge of how LMS works. Like, um, for example, K2 here can't see K10 because you have an intervening woods in K1 that's blocking view. Um, even if someone was on the second floor of K2, they can't actually see uh, ground floor of K10 here because, again, the woods is blocking it. Um, now, if K2, if someone was on the second floor of K2, wanted to see K9, that's possible because of the, um, the height advantage. <clears throat> Alright, so no rally and nothing in prep fire. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, the long and short of it is basically I feel like um, if the Mongolian player tries to set up forward, just like uh, I'm not an expert on, on ASL, so um, this is just like me as a, I tend to be an aggressive player, so I kind of like having um, more forward setups just because. Um, especially in a scenario like this, I don't have a lot of range, so not having range means I can't really, I don't want to do long range fire because it halves my range, or my firepower, um, and that's just a like killer on, on anything I want to do. So if I can force them to go into these open ground hexes and punish them for that, hence why this guy's there, why this is a fake, because it's really far forward, but why I also have units that are capable of taking shots into open ground. Like, this is covered by this guy. This guy can cover these hexes, and so on. Anyways, all to say that I want to do these sorts of things because I'm trying to... Um, rush. Because... Uh, jungle brush because PTO is not in effect. Yeah, that's not, uh, it's not PTO, so that's in brush, it's not marsh. Um, Alright, so Anyways, um, so looking at the map, because this is more exposed, like it looks more inviting, and it's more exposed to getting into the buildings by having a somewhat forward setup that I can retreat from without having any like serious issues. Um, like if I want to retreat these guys, they're generally going to be very safe um, for the sole purpose of um, while this is an open hex, the sight lines needed to see that hex specifically 
and with the range that he likely does not have is beneficial for me. Um, the fact that wood hexes are actually one movement factor instead of two means that um, if I'm really worried about it, then like if I don't want to move through um, G7 or sorry G8, then I can just go through the F7 X F8 uh, hex line. Um, I can even get into F9 on in one turn, which is pretty good. Um, I can get into G9 in one turn, and so on and so forth. Um, I could even get back to uh, H10 from this hex. Like I can get to a sniper in in that turn, so it's really strong stuff. Um, uh, Uh, delete the concealment that was on the guy. Depending on the move you do. Helps if you write it out. Like, if you move one hex, I won't know if that's salt move or just a one hex move. All right, um, yeah, I don't think he's ever done uh, live play then. Or if he has, then not in the, the sort of setup that we've got. Um, so yeah, so by, by having an open ground here, uh, a, re a retreat path into these hexes, and the same thing for these guys, right? These guys can, can well, this guy's fake, but um, this guy can retreat northwards, and I can instantly get cover on this railroad. Like, even if even if he has some guys in the railroad hexes, um, because of the range that he likely also d is suffering from, because neither, like, if his first lines are, are three range, um, he might have some four range elites. I forget specifically what he might have, but anything worse than those guys is either going to be three as well um, and have worse morale or maybe even uh, two, although I, I don't think that's the case. I think only the Russians have, um, I think only the Russians have two range stuff. Well, that's not true. There, there's some half squads out there. I think that also have that. Anyways, um, point being that uh, he's... Like, I'm not too worried if he's ever in here, and I rode through some open ground or whatever, because uh, I'm dictating, I'm able to dictate the pace of um, how I'm going to stall for time and, and so on. Um, yeah, so basically it's, that's like the, the main benefit. Um, if I ever get another unit into uh, this area, then getting him onto the second floor and say B1 is actually going to be really good because that height advantage should nullify um, wall advantage. I'd have to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, and depending on how little he pushes up on uh, on this side, either for fear of my own cavalry coming in, then that just gives me a free hand if I come up on the P1 road side. Because if I can get through... Uh, get in through p1 then i can easily i can immediately go around um the line of sight breaks here make it easy or at least like more beneficial um and then i can just essentially go up here on the road jump off here or keep going and then jump off in in any of these hexes um and as soon as i jump off these horses then you know immediately like all these buildings are going to be um are going to be uh, checked. So, 
Um, yeah, I think I've got I've got what six, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so I've got six squads um, that are coming in with two re uh, two leaders that are going to reinforce. The main benefit that I'm going to get from this not only is it the actually are they all three three sevens? Yes. Okay. So the main benefit of all the three three sevens is one, there's a lot of firepower there that I can just like throw away. Um, Uh, I'll tell you to stop asking. Is there's uh, someone if us at the events that I could do something? That's fine. Um, yeah, so typically how I play, or if I'm playing uh, another uh, human opponent, um, if I'm if I was to move, say my guy in in J10 right now, they're fake, but whatever. Um, but if I was to move this guy, then I wouldn't really care about. Uh, how much time I would give my opponent to pause for stuff. And the other reason is because he can't shoot with anybody to hit me. So I'm not really muffed about about that. So, um, still don't know if this if he's assault moving or not, which is a little frustrating. But yeah, it's really just like kind of whatever now this guy is going to move back because he's already moving guys up Actually, that's three, four. That actually wasn't that great a move. He could have gotten... Well, I guess like in the end, you're in the same hex. But if I was in O2, I would have just jumped the wall. That's two to get into O3. And then a third point to get into O4. And then you have a free movement factor you can do stuff with. Now, granted, like you can't go into either N4 or O5, but you can still get to P4. Not that it really matters, but you can still get there. Um, yeah, kind of just an odd choice. You don't even really get a benefit from, like, if I could shoot at N2, I would have, maybe, I, would, I wouldn't have done it, because there's no range. Um, there's no real range benefits, and you get a TEM, so you don't you don't really get any any bonuses from that. Not on my end, anyways. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, at this point it's all just internal monologue. Um, kind of wish that he was typing out his stuff so I can get a better idea, but... Um, I could have probably denied his concealment here. Actually, I don't think he would have had it anyways, but whatever. I'm gonna give him a break for first turn. Um, but technically these guys should have lost it because um, they're in LOS of an enemy unit and they are uh, not moving as a salt move. Even if it's in concealment terrain, they would lose it. It is... Um, I hate the concealment chart because it's like you can't like easily reference it sometimes. 
nobody's like digitized it to text as far as I know so like having to try and figure out every case just annoying um, so if it's within LOS uh, 16 hexes of a good order or unbroken enemy ground unit then uh, it's case A which is if it uses non-assault movement so regardless of anything else he does um, using non-assault movement means these two guys have to these two um, counters would have to draw their concealment also thinking about it uh, these guys I should have if I was being smart um, they should have hipped in P8 and the only reason I say that is because uh, P8 has sight through 08 and P7 so you can get 08, 07 just be sneaky um, and by being sneaky there then you can still like hopefully get a result if you don't whatever in the um, follow-up shot then that it, they would likely do you can still hit 08 and P7 with some good firepower but the more important thing is that you can run away up north to P9, P10 and so on and not really have to worry about it. The only problem is that uh, technically P10 doesn't have uh, an olive grove on the south side so fire trace through that hex side won't uh, shouldn't get the TEM I don't think. Uh, also, if you haven't ever played this yourself, um, highly suggest that you go into your preference, and in, in your preferences, you can. Um, there's a box on general, and it says auto report moves. It's the one, two, three, four, five, sixth from the top. Um, always have that checked because basically what it does is it types out the moves that you make so if I move a unit from N10 to N9 the game automatically writes it in the text uh, the text chat which is super useful because it basically means that like one you don't technically have to type anything which is nice um, and two if somebody screws up then you have something to point to. You can at least make sure that in the game it's being reported correctly, even if you make a typo or something. Now, typically, like my common partner for ASL, we type everything. So it's um, both harder and easier at the same time. Honestly, voice chat is probably the best thing uh, for ASL, just because it's very close to what you would normally be playing with. But, um, yeah. Also, it should probably be stated that uh, these guys on the hill can't actually see anybody below. And that's strictly just because these these guys here aren't at a higher level so you you can't really you can't really see off this cliff face huh uh, all right uh all right so that apparently is my opponent's move done um i'm gonna critique this because i think i should uh I don't like this at all. Moving these units is fine, but um, why these two haven't moved is beyond weird to me. Uh, this guy should have moved, and all four of these stacks should have moved. Even if it's just taking 
half of say this stack and assault moving them into this hex that's way better because if i had a unit in here which i, I don't they're concealed um but if i had a unit here one two three four so i'm not going to be stupid and shoot it's out of their out of range even if i had it um but if i could shoot him i would like if especially if he was exposed um as in non-concealed because that's a big stack same sort of applies for any of these hexes if i had the firepower for it i would shoot this is essentially um this entire move phase you, you've if if the chinese's job is to get to these buildings you're not doing it by sitting back um especially in a in a free essentially free uh, uh movement phase Now, technically, if he was trying to do something where um, he was saving his units for advancing fire phase, which is which is a thing, like you can do that. Um, but the problem with with that assumption on my part, anyways, is that um, you don't have anybody who's a, a declared uh, unit. So um, one of the things you can do in ASL, and I'm struggling to to um, find the word for it which i don't even know why because it's here opportunity fire so opportunity fire what it what it allows you to do is basically you put that counter on a unit it loses concealment when you do that um which is kind of why like opportunity fire sucks in a way um but the benefit of opportunity fire is that when you get to the advancing fire phase you can shoot at your full firepower rather than half normally in advancing fire phase you're automatically halved and all your firepower not including everything else you might you might have to modify stuff um but yeah having having your unit um having your unit retain that maximum firepower is good and the reason it's good is because let's say the chinese had a machine gun let's say for example um d3 here if d3 had a machine gun let's say a heavy machine gun or whatever um for the purposes of of this example now this heavy machine gun will say that um one he has he should have a sight line into f7 he also has a sight line into g7 now these machine guns would be firing at maximum firepower rather than the um half firepower that it would have for advancing fire so what you're essentially doing is you could have say these guys move up force these guys to draw concealment either because they're too close either because i want i feel like it's a good shot and then in doing that i now expose my g7 group to the d3 firepower so if you're playing this game uh, I don't see I mean I haven't seen that many games unfortunately I don't really see people use opportunity fire all that much um, but this would be a case where it could be very useful the same sort of applies if you're on defense because um, if I'm on defense and I declare some opportunity fires I'm basically telling my opponent that while I may not be shooting at them now they will take good shots later on in the turn and um to to me anyways by declaring that i'm either forcing my opponent to shoot at them because they can be dangerous later or to threaten them with um the possibility of doing more damage it's the same sort of thing in reverse basically of, of what a chinese strategy here could be if they had uh, if they had good machine uh, machine guns on them um, I guess technically even if they have light machine guns but they don't really have a lot of firepower so um, point being that um, let's say I had some throwaway units like I have a half squad somewhere in here now if, if I wanted to just throw away the half squad there's a 
phase tracker. The top of the click and next phase. Or just type it in, whatever. Um, okay, so uh, essentially, like I was saying, with the Chinese, it's it's the reverse. So um, if I had if I had a, my throwaway half squad here, and I wanted to reveal these guys, if I declare opportunity fire with, we'll assume this three three seven has a machine gun. By declaring opportunity fire with the machine gun, yes, I'm revealing the gun, but the half squad as he moves in, the, this guy would now have to make a choice. Does he shoot the half squad and reveal himself to now then get shot by this guy? Or in the advancing phase, like if, if the half squad doesn't even try to move in into the hex, which would be triple point blank fire, bad, blah, 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 blah. Um, um, would be really bad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, if I move into the hex, it drops his concealment. If he shoots at me, he drops concealment. If I get, if if I had a half squad in L7 and I get to N6 or whatever, and now I I'm in the advance phase and I'm right next to him, so I could technically shoot with the, the squad that moved first, because I don't believe opportunity fires have to shoot first. Um, so she cannot fire at preferred fires or move, may fire during the advance fire phase without penalty. Yeah, there's no, you don't have to actually shoot first. So again, if, if I have a half squad move into N6, then the half squad can shoot with advanced gun fire. And because it's a crap shoot anyways, and I want him to reveal this guy, if he does that, then he's essentially stripping concealment from this N5 group. And removing the concealment means that my machine gun now doesn't suffer the penalty of being halved for shooting at him. So it's it's considerations like that that um, uh, it's consider uh, considerations like that that are uh, important. Um, <clears throat> um, so this guy is going to lose concealment. I can't. I don't like removing concealment off of other people's stuff um, because it's rude, and I don't know if that's like doing anything. So uh, this guy is essentially revealing that he's got three three seven here for free, which, I mean, typically if you have concealment, you want to, you know, you kind of you. Since he's on the attack, it doesn't matter as much, but like you kind of want someone to you want to make him fight for because concealment is hard to gain, um, but easy to lose. And also, like, you, there's no value in this putting a guy in 06, like, it's gonna be my turn to shoot. So, if I shoot with anything, then like, essentially, you've this guy is in open ground. There's no TEM. There's no... I don't know. Like, sure, I don't really have much to shoot at him right now, because I'm at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Technically, I should shoot with this guy at, at for one firepower. I'm I'm dumb enough to try this, right? Because it's... It's a one, uh, that might actually be plus two for both these brushes. Um, yeah, so maybe I won't do that. But point point is still like, there's not much of a, there's not much of a reason to ever have this guy, these two squads get exposed, which is even better for me. And the reason why this is really good is because I can just shoot with this hip guy. That's two firepower flat, um, which is like really, I'll take it. Two fire, fire, fire flat. Like if I get a five or less, he's on a normal uh, normal morale check, and a PTC on six. Now considering it's a hip swan, I'm not actually going to do that because that's dumb. 
but as soon as he moves into 07 which he's threatening to do i essentially have this squad that's going to reveal dump six firepower into this hex and then on top of that it's going to be non-assault move unless it declares it and it's going to be open ground so it'll be a six down two so anything even if i get a nine i'm, I'm still getting a normal morale check all right no cc so my turn uh weather check Nine, no effects. No rallies. Or rally actions, I should say. Because technically you can do stuff in, in the rally phase. Um, for example, you could, you could, I could deploy this 337. Well, actually I can't. Because I don't think, um, I don't think me using conscript or partisans can, can deploy. Cause technically they'd be Russian um, either way like I could deploy I could maybe do another thing but can't so not much of a point um, <clears throat> no prep fire because I don't want to shoot with anything <clears throat> boom phase uh, I'm gonna have Uh, first and foremost, seven assault moves to about eight. Boom. Biggest move of the game right there. It's still concealment terrain, so he still keeps his concealment. And I retreat, which makes him think that this... Hopefully he'll think that L8 is a real unit. So if he ever tries to shoot on, it, on him, especially with um, either these three three. three sevens or if it reveals these squads um essentially i'm getting rid of his concealments or he's getting rid of his concealments for me which is good oh this also needs to be changed to axis <clears throat> all right uh next up I don't really care about moving those guys, so they'll stay there. But <sighs> eight seven two B seven so and I'm tempted to assault move this guy back into the woods, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think what I might do is I might assault move I could do a daisy chain. Yeah, you know what? Um, salt move. And I'm going to clone this. Create a thing. Move to F7. Now, theoretically, I can move these guys back. Um, I kind of like the position these guys are in, especially if they don't really do anything here or whatever. I can just assault move into these woods. Just makes it annoying for the Chinese player, really. Because um, if I can get if I can get into these woods, it just means he's got to try and rat me out somehow. Um, the only problem with the move, yeah, the only problem with moving here to J6 is that by moving there, I'm getting into the three range that he's already displayed he has. So, I mean, there's not much of a benefit of me going in there. That's it for moves. Yeah, not really much I want to do with regards to moving. It's like, the only, things, the only other things to consider would be Moving this guy, I guess, but I don't want to look too weak on here too early. That's why I only move this guy. Um, 
there's not much of a point of moving this guys. If I moved him into N1, there's nobody with view, so he'd keep his concealment, which is good. Um, but there's not much of a point. Like, I, I would much rather keep this wood hex mine um, and fight until he gets to at least adjacent and then run away into, say, M2. Especially if... Um, cool. <clears throat> no advancing fire... No, no routes or roust. Roost or routes either. Uh, advances. Now, the thing with advances, I don't really have a reason to advance anywhere. Um, these guys are just going to stay there just to be annoying. Keep them guessing, really. I could advance to C7 and then it would keep his concealment, but honestly, moving towards him is just kind of a bad bad idea at the moment this is more of a play to make him think it's real rather than anything else um, I can move this guy here to K1 but kind of doesn't really do too much so uh, cool no advances no CC there right of seven so again this is the so if if there's one piece of advice i would like to give to anybody who's listening um also my, my apologies uh for you uh people watching um in case some of these episodes get dry because oh my god we're gonna do a lot of them um maybe not always with the same opponent but uh you know at least um I kind of want to get this project off the ground and playing every ASL scenario I have in order. Um, chronological order. So, uh, yeah. Anyways, so the big thing to keep in mind is that um, there's seven turns. Now, this guy, for example, right? Because there's seven turns, you might not actually ever do anything with this group. I don't know. Um, I don't know why you would never do anything with this group, but it's possible now let's say best case scenario this guy has to get to this furthest hex right we'll put we'll say j2 will be nice right okay so he needs to get to j2 to win let's say that's his only condition is to win nothing prefer fingers so let's say J1 needs to get to J2 on the opposite board to win. That's the only condition. The fastest route he can take, let's say he doesn't see X, right? Um, just for the sake of argument. Now, doesn't have a leader, doesn't see X. They're just regular squads, which this could be. I don't know. So J2 is 1, K3, 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4 gets the K5 in a turn. All right, turn two, K6, L6, L7 stops. That's two turns. So we're now on turn four, and he's gotten halfway. Now he has to get to J2. So K8, K9, J9. That's three turns. So we're already at turn five, and he's just getting there. But turn six, he can get in. Like, by turn six, he can get in there without doing any special actions, without advancing. I mean, even if he advanced, uh, he would still only get to J1, I think. Because it's three turns, so three advances. Um, whatever. Point is, is that if, if you don't have anything special, you're only getting there by turn six. Assuming that nothing bad happens. And that's not even the furthest hex that that guy could, could go. In the sense of, like getting to an objective let's say we say that the objective is j4 uh, g4 right g4 is the same sort of idea if you're going on the railroad sure it's it's like i forget if it's one or two i'd have to look it up real quick but you're still going one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen hexes they're not all going to be one 
one cost. Even if they are, that's that's three turns, barring any special actions. Right? So, actually, it's, it's three turns with special actions. It's four turns with them. The point remains the same. You need to think about how far it, are your guys going to be able to travel. Because if he only has two leaders, he might have three or four. I don't know. Um, but if he has four leaders, for example, okay, so we can just, let's say L2, this guy, that guy, and that guy all have leaders. These guys are screwed in terms of movement. They'll never get to the end zone. So if something bad happens to the other heck, the other stacks, then yeah, you're screwed. <clears throat> uh, assault movement was not declared, so I'm I'm calling that as a as a shot. It's six six down two. So that is a four on six. Four on six is two morale check. Four on um, assault movement. Four on six, two morale check. <clears throat> so defensive first fire. So not only, not only is this guy now taking a two morale check on two squads. I don't even care to guess how many how many squads he has. This is there's a lot of squads, but if these guys break, they're screwed. If they break, they have to. Where are they gonna retreat to? The only places they can retreat realistically are, are these hexes, right? Um, I guess technically, uh, no. These are the closest, so he has to go here. These two hexes can now be interdicted by this guy. If he doesn't break, I don't think he will. But if he doesn't break, then these guys have to will essentially be taking more damage. Um, so these two squads are screwed. I, when you're doing these sorts of moves, don't move in stacks. They're, that's bad. Um, anyways, so uh, these guys now take two morale checks, which means that on a seven, if if you're rolling average, they're both breaking. So you gotta hope that your your rolls are good, um, and on top of that, because I'm I used six firepower, that gets halved, and I get two uh, residual on that hex. So anytime somebody else goes through that exact same hex, they're now taking a two firepower shot automatically. Is in place. No interference. That can affect, affect the shot. Right. So, um, essentially, this is like this will be a really big error. Um, yeah. This is this will be a problem. And this is also why like. When I'm playing this and I'm I'm making assault moves, I write down to my opponent specifically that I'm doing assault moves. Because if you if if you're not writing anything down, I I don't know, right? Um, your opponent doesn't know, and when your opponent doesn't know something, you you, you kind of have to assume it's going to be the worst case thing. Um, if it doesn't work in your favor, then I mean, too bad. You should have you should be writing this stuff down. Um, I mean, it's a little cutthroat because you know, giving giving my opponent the bee's knees uh, right away. But I mean, we've got so many scenarios that we'll we'll end up learning stuff regardless. So making making mistakes, quote unquote, early uh, in this project is not a big deal. Um, but also, just like making mistakes isn't whatever. You shouldn't be beating yourself up for mistakes, anyways. Not an ASL, that's for sure.
it's just a board game after all. Um, but yeah, so that was a really good roll. Um, had I gotten one less, uh, it would have been a K. Actually, yeah. Had I gotten a three, it would have been even better because um, a K result is basically a one of these units would automatically have to casualty reduce, so go down to a half squad, um, which is just again good for me because by doing <clears throat> by doing that, I'm effectively like that's a half of a squad you're never getting back, um, and then they automatically take a morale check anyways. So you're getting a little more bang for your buck, so to speak. Obviously, the king is always to get a KIA, which is um, where you outright kill a unit, and then everything just breaks. It's, uh, yeah, it's powerful stuff. You don't really see KIA as all that much, but yeah. Also, oh, that's different, whatever. Notification. Um, for future watchers, uh, if uh, the audio sucks, let me know so I can fix it. At the moment, I'm just doing whatever I can, hoping that I don't like pick up a lot of residual stuff outside of this. And I also hope my typing isn't like super loud. I gotta type for speed sometimes, but hopefully it's not so bad. I don't, I don't know what's so, like, my opponent is stopped, and I don't know what. Because I don't roll morale checks for him, so essentially he has to do that. Maybe he's just checking up on results or whatever. Uh, yeah, so it's a strong attack, two morale check, like... You, don't, you can't really get away from that too much. A normal morale check, you're generally going to be fine. <clears throat> it's all manual. Exactly. Uh, same with the R. Gotta calculate. Calculate. Turn on. Alright. Perfect. So. Now, these two squads not only break, but ELR. There's two. Over at, at a two. So essentially, it sucks because I actually have to unbreak these guys. Um, flip, and then these guys ELR. So control E, and then control E then break them again <clears throat> so why that's super strong and why that's something to keep in mind is that um, I'm just gonna oh I don't have one shit um, okay so the reason why ELR is actually like super important and why you don't want to ever become um, a victim of ELR is because these guys both ELR and normally that's Normally, if a first-line squad like this breaks, the reason why it's not so bad is because on the reverse side, I think they have six. Now, six isn't a great number to begin with, right? When you break, you automatically get a DM, which adds a plus four to your next rally roll. So it's tough, right? Um, but theoretically, still possible if you have a leader that's like decent. Um, most leaders are decent. The only ones that really suck are like the plus ones. Anyways, so the by ELRing, instead of having a six, those units are now now have a broken morale of five. And instead of being first line troops, they're now conscripts for the rest of the match. Provided they don't heat a battle and whatever, but that's like special stuff. So essentially these guys are now permanently worse. And Having these two guys broken so early also means that when they route, which they have to route to these hexes, right? By having to route, they now have to go back to a hex and hope that there's a leader there. Because the leader is the only thing that will be able to rally these guys. 
um, by themselves, technically, they could tr they can try to rally um, during his turn. But if they don't rally, they're just stuck. Um, if I want to make it hard on my opponent, if, let's say he rallies to 05 and doesn't go further, because technically, technically, if this guy routed to 05 successfully, he could then make it to N4, right? But if he makes it, if he doesn't go to N4 and I shoot at him when he's at 05 with, say, this guy, they're automatically DM'd again, which reapplies the plus four and thus makes it that much harder for him to ever rally. Um, this is kind of, uh, this usually leads to a dilemma, at least for me it does. Uh, I'm sure some other players it happens as well. The dilemma is that if you, if you, if I decide, if I break these guys, which I did, if I shoot at them with another squad, say these guys, right? Do I want to waste, quote unquote, waste my shot on them to potentially break them again? Or do I save this guy's shot for something better, aka these other groups? Now, um, for all intents and purposes, I'm, I wouldn't be able to see them with this guy. This is not much of a point. Even if I did choose to shoot with this guy, like it's kind of a waste. Um, I don't have that six firepower bonus and, and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the fact that I could shoot at him and then now that he's got a five morale, he, that's the same morale check or the morale level he has to apply to his morale checks. So instead of having seven, these two squads now have five again permanently. So, um, Yeah, you can't ELR uh, when they are broken. Kind of a dumb limitation. I'm saying this out loud because one, I want you guys to know what I'm typing. And two, because um, hopefully one of the devs for the, the Vassal uh, module, um, I think one of them is Mr. Rimmer. I hope that he hears this so that he can then like <laughs> make it possible because you can you can heat a battle stuff or you can berserk stuff when they're broken you can fanatic stuff when you're broken you can flip them to unbreak them and so on and so forth but the two options that are great out are battle harden and elr um, and i think that just kind of sucks because by doing by graying out those two options you always have to flip them over um, to their good side which just kind of gets confusing I think really, if if there's a fix to this, it would be to make ELR possible while broken, because that comes up way more often. Because more people internalize that you break a unit, and then you realize that you ELR. So you most people, in, in you know, most people see it as break and then ELR rather than ELR and then break. No, until later. But maybe. Oh, done movement. Yes. Very much so. Alright, so immediately he's now only moving one guy instead of both. This is very smart. Um, I think he should have done it in the first place, but whatever. Because, so the reason why you kind of um, discourage uh, moving in a stack is then these two squads moving up to 07 what did that gain them would you have gained anything having these two stack uh, these two squads move together if you could have gotten the same result by moving alone squad that first fired Then have three for power flat. Okay, two for power. One day I'm gonna use the um, incremental IFT because that is king. Sick. Okay, so that's a four. That is a four on two, which is a one morale check. Four on two, one morale check. That is sick. So uh, these are good rolls. 
and and obviously good rolls and something that I should be keeping in mind because um, you know law of averages that's gonna bite me in the ass later. Theoretically, it could bite me in the ass right now if he like heat of battles or something, but. Also, hindrance. I'm going to look at, uh, or residual, I should say. Residual firepower. It's, I'm pretty sure it's halved and then decreased only by hindrance. Uh oh, non hexite TM and smoke apply. So, um, because there is a plus one TEM for the woods. I don't actually get, uh, it would be halved to, uh, why is he saying six? Six? Uh, why I got this? Um, six plus one, can I see? Seven. Pit. All right, so uh, thankfully this is happening at random, so it's easier. So basically this guy equaled his morale. So, you know, that's an average roll. So something, whatever. But he pins because he's, yeah, he equaled his... Uh, thing now if it was a 2 MC that guy would have broken and I'd be even happier but uh, yeah um, now because it's doubled and then halved that would be a two and because it's two it's halved well first off, it's halved if I want to do residual fire um, but then there's a minus because of the non hexite to you no residual possible Which sucks because, um, so because there's no residual, essentially, like, yeah, it's kind of, it's just a shame because, um, uh, if anybody else, like, these squads can now move in there without any real issue, um, and because of that, then, you know, they're not taking free shots, which is essentially what I would want. Um, in a different world, if I was luckier, I guess he would have moved these squads to P6 and then I would have taken that shot because a P, uh, shot into P6 um, even if it's a 2 firepower the minus 2 and all that um, having a 1 residual here and then in a follow up shot getting a residual there would have been uh, more ideal for me I guess in a defensive slash perfect world where all my rolls are great and all that I also didn't cower on either of my shots, which is nice. Um, yeah, so this guy's gonna move here. It doesn't state if it's set an assault move or regular assault. You know what? It doesn't matter. I don't particularly care if this is just an assault move. I just, I'd rather know because you're supposed to declare it, but whatever. Maybe him not saying anything is him not declaring it. It just kind of leaves me in a limbo because the other guy I play with is very different on that sort of thing. <clears throat> That's not an assault move. They drop concealment. That's also why it's really important, because not assault moving means this guy gets revealed. Which then just gives me options for 
whether I want to shoot with anybody. Which at the moment isn't something I want to do, but... Something to always keep in mind if you're playing. It's also why, like, I don't like the idea of um, uh, PBM. I'm sure people have good idea, good opinions of uh, play by email, but um, PBEM is just. Eh. I don't want to wrap my head around it. The idea of like making all your moves and then you send them the save file and then, you know, Buddy gets the save and then plays out the turn in sequence. There's a inherent level of trust, and um, I don't know. I've seen enough people that like count counters and stuff like uh, you know if I'm being completely honest I don't know why that scan flip again um, if I'm being completely honest I have Adobe reader open on the side and it's got the scenario card I could look at exactly what my opponent has that kind of defeats the purpose especially when you start throwing concealments into the mix the purpose is to not know what your opponent has so for me to say like, oh, well, these two guys broke, and I know that he only has 13 first line squads means that I now know that I have this many to, you know, not deal with or whatever. It's kind of the same, like, um, like I didn't write the, the special rule, I probably should have, but, so, the one of the special rules is that um, the Chinese player can, can um, only elite squads can use LMGs without uh, penalty and attempt to repair them. So if I break, if I see an LMG on a non-elite squad, I know. Like, I just know, right? And if I break an LM, uh, a squad, let's say, like, one of these guys is elite, right? So if I know that one of these guys is elite, I can immediately... Okay. So, so if these guys, if one of these guys is elite, or if that's just one squad, concealment's kind of screwy sometimes. But if one of these guys is is um, elite, and I and I see him, right, and I break him, it's like, oh, I know that there is now two other elite squads. It kind of just, I don't know. I feel like it just cheapens the value that uh, concealment has and just the fact that like i don't know if you're if you're counting counters like you're it's like being an accountant you're more interested in you know in in fine tuning um specifically how you play asl rather than what you should be doing which is just like enjoying the game if you're if you're playing ASL because you're pretending that you want, you know, you're like, um, you're playing as a leader or whatever in, in World War II, then you should also probably realize that, like, you kind of need to, uh, they drop con concealment. <clears throat> Um, two, uh, is an olive grove, eh, it's not open ground, so, whatever. Um, so, anyways, the point is, is that, um, the point is, is that by counting all of the counters on the map you're doing something that a real commander would never know like okay to a degree like you know how many tanks a guy has or whatever because like it's the only big thing on the map but you know i don't really know how many lmgs a guy should have especially you know it gets it kind of gets muddied even more when it's like Oh, uh, well, in a combat zone, would you be able to see, um, like, would you be able to tell how many bars or heavy machine guns that a opponent has in a given, you know, it's just, 
you can pick out one or two, maybe, if they're both shooting at the same time stuff. But, but you don't know for sure. Anyways, small rant over, because, yeah, just not a fan of it. I forget if, if I need to declare that there's, um, uh, yeah, you know what, uh, I think I need to show a real unit to prove I strip concealment. So, revealing the seat. Actually, you know what? Uh, cool. There. That way, there's no way to not know which hex it was. Also, um, kind of obvious as to why I would pick C1 to reveal. One, because this guy's not going to be shooting anyways, and it's a valuable spot to be defending. Two, because I don't want him to know that this guy is real, or if this guy could see that location, I don't want him to know that this guy's real. I also don't want him knowing this guy's real. But that's kind of why I still have concealment in all layers. Revealing this guy is basically the um, least valuable of all of these units. All of these units, anyways. Um, the other thing, too, is that. Um, Having this guy reveal, he retained, like, revealing a unit to strip concealment does not force that unit um, to lose concealment themselves. It just proves that they're real. Um, this is to prevent people from just saying, like, oh, well, that guy's, you know, this guy's fake, that guy's fake, that guy's fake, etc. It'd be kind of easy at a, to a certain degree. Oh, I can get, you know what? I can get even closer, so I'm just do this. You can also see where the overlays don't perfectly fit onto the maps, but whatever. This guy will go up three. Uses concealment up five. Two, oh eight. All right, so I now know he has two elite squads in here, which is perfect for me, honestly. I'd rather he lose that concealment. And, okay, so another thing, too, is that we can see the benefits here. So, these first line squads, 337s, elites are 447s. So, better firepower, like, immensely better. Because if you're not playing on an IIFT, this is always down to a 2. Which just means they're not as great as a 3 would imply. Now, obviously, if you're adjacent and you double and it's a 6, whatever, it's better, but not great. Um... And the increased range is, you always want range. Range is always, 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 always good. <laughs> oh, eight. So, LOS feature, cool. So, we can see the green line goes from 08 to L4, range is 5, which for O oh, for uh, line of sight 16 is fine. Um, but I can I can see there because the brush is not um, does not block line of sight. So this stack now gets to reveal itself, which means again that that is like super good for me because that's concealment that um, is easily taken away, but again, hard to uh, hard to regain. So, I shall take it. Four four M three. Where did he have something in M three to move off board? Why did he move this?
Uh, I should mention that tropical including desert climates at times. All right, cool. So he's got a leader, an LMG, and an elite squad. All right, which is great because um, so to get from L2 to L3, which is where he started, that's two minimum. Pretty sure it's two, three, and then five to get into MM, uh, M5. Which again is great because, hey, if you've got a leader that I can now see, I now know one of your best assets and where it is. <clears throat> now, I can see why he would do this because this is a good base of fire. Uh, is he? Hold on here. I want to see. LMG does he have? Those are two sixes. He's got the wrong LMG. Same in almost all respects, except it's a six range instead of seven. I'll let him know afterwards. Um, yeah, so I can see why he has this here. This is a good base of fire, technically. Um, <clears throat> having... Uh, can this guy see there? He's not on the second floor. Shit, I should have put him on the second floor. I'll do that next turn. Um, so, good base of fire because, you know, four range, so you can hit these targets. You can especially hit this guy. So, next turn, this guy has to skedaddle. Um, yeah, he'll most likely move, have to move um, in like bypass terrain here. in H2. But that is, what, three, at least? That's the thing, too, like, by remaining concealed, he doesn't really know who can see what. So revealing this guy means that you know I don't have to. I don't have to um, reveal what could or could not be good or bad, and etc. Uh, B seven. B seven. <clears throat> Units at the moment would have to show if they are okay to stroke. So basically, he's just asking if uh, this should reveal because um, B7 exists, which technically has LOS, and G7 exists, which technically has, well, which has LOS. Um, but because neither of them are real, they technically don't have, um, don't show it. That group's gonna lose sailings from C1. Is an olive grove, but is a full hex hindrance. Uh, yeah, that sucks. What's he got here? Conscripts and a six plus one. Yeah, I don't care about this. Although, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Oops. Technically, if I shot with this guy, it's it's a one firepower shot. But it is down two. And yeah, so his conscripts are also three three sixes, which is like really bad. Not something you really want to be fighting with. It, they are two. Which is pretty tough. Yeah, the other thing too is that 
Um, let's say I try. There's no reason to try stripping concealment, like at random. If I reveal this guy to be a fake, one, it can't because it would just go away, and two, then my opponent knows it's a fake. So there's nothing. There's nothing you can really do at that point to um, to truly affect the game. It would affect, uh, it affects one or two things, because technically, like, the, um, there's like one or two things that don't rely on it being a real unit that could change things, but uh, other than that, there's nothing really. It's just not something you want to do. Man, turn four is going to be fun when I get all this cavalry. That's the thing, too, is that having all this cavalry come in, now that he's moved all his guys up, this is dangerous for him, in a way, because if my cavalry all comes in on this hex, or in these hexes, right, this is technically blind spots to this base of fire. So I could, like, go into 04, dismount, and then go into N4 and 05. I wouldn't, obviously not if he's got somebody in, in 05. And there's the worry of like who could shoot at him and whatever, but the point remains that by um, I could theoretically be in a lot of or he could theoretically be in a lot of trouble um, by leaving this open, which is why like I thought it was a good idea for him to have like if it was me I'd have some conscripts. Um, I mean, first off, I would have picked the left side entirely. Um, or the right side, I would have never done split, because split is more of a um, uh, split is more a thing, in my opinion, for like defense. Or if you have like a if there's a reason to split, there's not. I don't really think there's much in, in this one, especially with how I've set up. I think you you should honestly just have like just take it and run. Just like pick a side you think will have less units, and then go. Establish a base of fire if you have to with like the elites, and then like conscripts are just just throw them in. Um, do I have any defensive fire? No. Defensive fire. So yeah. Anyways, by like I would have had a conscript in O two. Um, I would have. I would have kept. I would have had some uh, a push with conscripts uh, early on to grab these woods and the the, the olive grove because grabbing this is powerful. And precision goes. Yep. Um. So anyways, grabbing these are really important, if you ask me, to prevent the cavalry from coming in. The same as having at least one guy in O2, maybe someone in M3, I don't really think that's necessary. Um, and after the successful push into here with conscripts, then you have like your first line and elites go into these woods or whatever, um, or the brush and then into the woods. By having conscripts go here, you can then pull them back once it's done by running them into these woods, and then you're essentially preventing the uh, Mongolian player from, from using the cavalry all that much. It's risky though, and it, it, it's very risky because you're depleting your, your forces to defend a spot that may not be useful. However, by also doing that, you're kind of ensuring that Mongolian player has to deploy, um, or set up, I guess is the proper term, up here and then go along this railway, uh, the railway line, because it's not even a bridge, it's just railway. Um, yeah, so, you know. I just think it's, um, yeah. It, it's also, like, I don't understand why this guy didn't move, or these guys. Um, this is also a stack that's done nothing for two turns now. Like an entire stack that's done nothing. Um, considering 
what I've seen, he's gonna have like he's Chinese, so he's gonna have a lot of conscripts. So conscripts here, conscripts there. Two of these groups are conscripts, for sure. Um, he had conscripts, or he had first lines up here. So yeah, there's gonna be a wave of guys coming through this side, but he should have done this like a turn ago. You keep you keep this guy for rallies because whatever it's a six plus one it can't it's not gonna do much anyways um, but at least like you know you got something also I forgot to look up uh, Mongolian family names most common Mongolian surnames show all names all right so. Uh, where's one of my leaders? You. You get to be named Gonbold. Cool. And then this guy gets to be named Ungeto. That's sick. And then uh, this guy. Your name is going to be Purev. And lastly, this nine neg one is going to be uh, Gansuk. Sweet. And that's how you name leaders, folks. You should always name leaders. Leading name, uh, Naming leaders is always cool and good. It should always be done. Also helps story wise. Because you can be like, oh yeah, uh, you know, instead of, oh, this 6 plus 1 guy, it could be, you know, um, Corporal Lin, or I don't really know many Chinese names. So uh, pick one yourself, I guess, is the, the uh, advertisement I'm giving. You don't even need anything crazy, really. Just whatever works. It's more memorable that way. And, you know, not something incredibly racist it always helps. Man, I feel like he's... My opponent is deliberating on what they should do and are choosing not to do anything. Like, I have a feeling that he's debating if he should do anything with this group. And, yeah. Okay. <sighs> so this guy is going to shoot. This is going to shoot at him. So uh, that's a one firepower shot to there because he's pinned and it's advancing fire. So, and he wasn't an opportunity fire, he moved. So the three goes up to six for being adjacent then halved for advancing fire down to three and then pinned, which halved it to 1.5. Um, and fractions are always rounded down. So. Firepower plus plus one TM. Um, now, considering it's our first match together, I'm not really gonna, you know, not much has not much to say about that. But um, probably not that great of a shot. The only reason I say this is because um, whenever you're getting into one firepower, if there's if you're adding plus modifiers to it, it's not that great. Um, just plain and simple uh, it kind of just sucks but the reason the main reason people will try to dissuade people from low odd shots is that to get a good result on this you need let's check the um, check the thing here 
So if you want a good result on a one, especially with a plus one uh, attributed to the shot, you need to have a three or less to get a morale check. Everything else is a pin task. If he gets a pin task on me, it doesn't matter. I can't move this guy because it's not my turn. So he needs to get a three. If he gets a three, that's my sniper. If he activates, if my sniper activates, could be devastating for him. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those like, if you want to be cognizant about someone's uh, sniper, you, yeah, keep it in in your back pocket. Yeah, so he cowers, so that's a zero fire firepower shot. Um, this is also one of those cases where, um, so if if this guy was broken, but was not um, DM'd, it's not possible. But let's assume. Um, that shot would not trigger the broken unit to be DM'd because he was able to, because he cowered, he effectively does not have a firepower shot at this point. These guys are, are frozen in the woods, kind of just not really knowing what to do. So yeah, anyways, that's a uh, no effect. I'll just put an advancing fire on that guy. Don't really have to, but whatever. Just put easier that way. That's the other benefit too, um, for those wondering, um, of keeping your guys concealed for a little bit. Like I could have opened up with this squad on these guys. Sure, I could have taken this squad and shot this this group. Um, same with this stack. Could I, I could have had these guys shoot, but the. The point in all this is because he needs to get here, I don't think he's going to get 15 CVP at this rate. Um, two turns in, nothing's broken. One guy's revealed. Uh, I'm, I'm not too worried about how things are going to play out at the moment. Um, but the basic thing to keep in mind is that because his objective is to get here and capture these buildings, anytime I can get, I can force him to waste here against these guys. It's time I'm gaining, essentially. If if I don't shoot with this guy, he doesn't know if this guy's real or not. So he's not gonna he's he may not shoot at him. And if he does shoot at him, that's that's a shot that he's wasted for the next turn. Don't be zero. Zero fiber. Um, but yeah, so it's one of those, like, theoretically, because he's got three firepower, yeah, you could take a shot here. Um, you're, you're getting a hindrance, like, it's probably still not worth it with conscripts, really. But if these guys weren't conscripts, I'd take that shot. If I had, say, um, elite guys, if these guys were here, I would take... I would shoot with these guys into this hex because even though it's a plus two um, I'm still getting a four firepower out of it and well actually it's halved again so it's a two firepower shot up two now if I'm desperate I'll probably still take that shot because two up two like as long as I can get a four which won't trigger um, Mongolian sniper but as long as I can get a four I can strip these guys on a pit test check but again, it just kind of uh, reinforces the point that um, if I was doing something about this, like if I really wanted to, to, if I wanted to rush this side, right, as the Chinese, where he had four big stacks, um, first and foremost, like these guys, I would have probably. Um, if I, if I had a better understanding of human wave, I would have totally done a human wave and just like run all these stacks into these hexes, all of the concealment terrain ones. Um, even if I chose not to, I would have, I, I forget if I can, if you can deploy as Chinese, 
if you could, I'd deploy and then send a half squad in. And then he either has to shoot or doesn't. And if he shoots, then he's real and I can isolate him because... Um, and the reason this guy's fake, really, is because this guy has nowhere to go. This guy technically, like, it, had had he not gotten this squad here, it'd be better for me, for sure. And that's why, like, when, when reviewing this, I was like, oh, shit, I should have had a hip guy in P7 rather than give him the out of the woods hex. Which I didn't, I wasn't thinking of at the time. So, uh... For future reference for me, hopefully I'll internalize this, but um, should have had my hip guy in P7. Um, anyways, so if I had this guy in P7, technically in P in 08, he could still kind of do the same. By going into P8 and then continuing up, I still have the option, like I still have, you know, two hexes out of four that are protected. If I go up with this guy, I have three hexes to go, and none of them are protected. Um, nope. You can shoot into uh, at any concealed unit, but you carry the hat penalty against them, plus any other etc um so my opponent is asking if they can shoot at concealed units and the answer is yes yeah there's nothing that stops you from shooting at a concealed unit um other than your own desire honestly to uh to shoot or not shoot at them this guy i should have advanced now that i think about it i should have advanced them to l9 but whatever it's the only assault move from l7 and l8 but um i guess technically keeping him in l8 makes him a little bit more um dangerous because if he is real, then he still has that um, possibility of, especially shooting at 07. Um, if he's fake, or he, um, by moving here too, uh, these two stacks get the plus one hindrance for shooting at him. So it's also a bonus. Yeah. I think some I forget um, I forget if the video is called that um, it's been ages since I watched it but there's a video out there I think called geometry of ASL um, gives you a good idea uh, or hopefully gives you good ideas on how to look at a map how to analyze it it sucks that um, Vassal only allows you to see a board from one direction you can't actually cut them cut boards in or rotate boards after you you place them, um, which is unfortunate because um, looking at a board in one sense, you know, we'll say vertically in in this case, um, it's it's easy to see sight lines, you know, across these hexes. It's easy to see the road and how it's leading up, and how it winds, you know, from left to right and so on. Um, but yeah, so because of that, you, you there's issues like that. Um, now, can I refuse a surrender in for a no quarter? I'm just gonna check here. Options of a warrant pre. Just checking if if no order is possible. Um, so right now my opponent is checking to see um, if he can surrender because now I, so he didn't want to shoot with anything else, which is a little surprising. Um, but it means that these guys are um, now effectively stuck there, and when a unit begins a route phase next to an enemy unit they have to surrender to it um, if there's no um, possible route that isn't with interdiction so because n7 and 6 o6 and p6 are all open ground and he can't route to p7 because it's still adjacent this guy technically or these squads technically have to 
um, they technically have to uh, surrender. Now, in ASL, you can you can choose to not accept a um, uh, a surrender, and doing so invokes no quarter. Um, no quarter can be bad because it means you can't take prisoners. Not taking prisoners um, effectively just kind of it can screw around with your the combat value or casualty value that you can get. And I don't see anything that prevents me from using no quarter. So I think I will do that. Because, um, and the reason I, I want no quarter, well, the reason one is because I don't want to deal with, um, uh, with uh, prisoners. Because if this guy gets prisoners, while I can split them into two half squads, that makes it so that if anything happens um, and this guy shoots at them, they can, the prisoners can come back. And I don't want that. Um, so no quarter may opt to reject the instant and eliminate instead, but if it does so all, will subsequently always use low quarter or risk interdiction to avoid surrendering, even if disrupted. Yeah, okay. Invoking no corner. Booth die. Booth die. So, um, so yeah, the reason I don't want to do this is because there's two squads, which makes it dangerous in a sense. Um, I don't want him having, um, either of them available for anything. Those are two squads I want permanently gone. Um, if if I had a reason to keep prisoners, I would have done it. Um, but again, the problem with prisoners is that if something happens to this unit, who's now watching over the prisoners, if something kills him, the prisoners come back. And yeah, if I can do something to... Um, reduce the effectiveness of uh, his entire order of battle, I'm going to do it. The other benefit to me, too, is that if I suddenly choose that I want to keep him here, even though it's a really bad idea because these guys can shoot at him, this guy can shoot at him, this guy can shoot at him, and this guy can shoot at him, um, by having this guy stay here and shoot at this, at this pin guy, he won't be pinned next turn, but if I shoot at him, um, that's six firepower of one, doable on a on a regular roll. And if he gets unlucky, he'll break, and then he too has to run away. Um, now, if I had captured them as prisoners and then shot this guy, and he broke, uh, technically he he would also become a prisoner, and then I'd have you know some sort of like circus traveling circus of of squad and prisoners. Which isn't really all that great, so. Um, I think that's it for route phase. Yeah, that's it for route phase. Unless you want to fall in terribly great. Right. Guys. Uh, as a joke, always ask your opponent if they want to voluntarily break units. Um, I think it's only technically doable with a leader. So, for example, this guy could choose to voluntarily break, the entire stack breaks, and then they route to whatever is the most um, appropriate destination. It's a dumb thing you should there's very rarely a case for you to do it um, the only time you want to voluntarily break stuff is if you're like capable of um, rallying them rather rather easily like if I had a 10 down two leader I'd probably voluntarily break just so I can route somewhere and then next turn you know he's back in action unless I get really unlucky but you know whatever shouldn't 
if you're hoping on luck um, in ASL, you're going to be disappointed. So he advanced this guy, okay. Just gives me more fuel to put this guy on the second floor next turn. End of a pH? Alright. Perfect. Oh, let's see. Cool. So this has been dash one. Uh, but that seems unless you want a backup. All right. So Mongolian. Turn to start. All right, so uh, that's episode one. Um, judging by our pace, it's probably going to take us another two episodes, uh, just because we lost a lot of time at the start for setup and some slowdown. But otherwise, yeah, it's going to we'll speed up. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time.